In this video, we'll go through all of the major changes and additions for V-Ray 6 Update 1. For this, we will check out the improved frame buffer, explore the updated V-Ray decals with cylindrical projections, play with the new light decay modes, and much more. So V-Ray 6 for 3ds Max Update 1 has just been released. So in this video, we will go through what I personally think are the most important new features. We will break them down one by one so that you can make the most use of them in your projects. So let's start with some changes in the frame buffer and the first change is that you now are able to mask the glare effects that you have here. So we have these four different light bulbs and then I also generated here a crypto mat render element and now if we want to we can just easily add a new layer and then we add a crypto mat mask. So once I add the mask the glare effect first disappears completely because I first need to choose which of those elements should have a glare effect. So I can easily just use this pick button in here and then choose for example this light bulb to have a glare effect or this one in here or this one but not have a glare effect on the red one. Or I can invert the mask that means that all of my elements have glare effect in the scene except the ones that I selected in here. So this is quite a handy feature if you have like some of the elements where you don't want to have a glare effect you can easily exclude them without having to go through an external program. Some other changes have been made in the light mix. So once I go to the light mix tab in here and I didn't add a light mix render element before I can now do that directly through here. So it will do that for me. I would still need to re-render the scene. And then you notice now I immediately have the light mix in here. You also notice that I immediately get an update here. You don't have to wait until the light cache is calculated. Everything happens quite instantly. And that's also a new change that has been done in the light mix. So by default, the light mix groups all of my self illumination materials here in this one tab. I can switch them on or off or change the intensity, for example, make them brighter or make them less bright. But what if I want to control them separately? The good news is that now in V-Ray 6.1, you have the option for that. So in the light mix render element, you can separate the emissive channel. So once you do this and restart the rendering in here, you can see that now all of my different emissive shaders here are separated. For example, I can switch off the green one or I can switch off the yellow one. I can change the different brightnesses in here and I can change also the color, for example, make this yellow one a bit more warm, for example, so it's also kind of reddish and so on. So that's quite a nice addition to have now the option to separate all of them and be able to control them even more detailed through the light mix in here. So V-Ray 6 introduced clouds in the V-Ray Sun Sky system and now in V-Ray 6.1, this option has been expanded on. So if I enable my clouds, there's now some additional values that you can tweak in here. So now, for example, there is this density multiplier. And if you look at the clouds as we have them now, they look kind of dark, kind of like stormy clouds. And with this density multiplier, you can reduce this darkness effect and they integrate then much nicer into the sky. You can also boost the effect for whatever reason, if you want really, really black clouds or just go to some very, very faint clouds and so on. And like this just get exactly the kind of result that you want. Also now there's this new seed parameter where you can just generate easily a totally new pattern of the cloud without having to mess with this offset X and Y in here and just very fast explore what kind of clouds you wanna have in your particular scene. So now let's reduce the density so that I can show you another new value and that are these contrails. So if we enable them, you get these kind of like lines in here that just look like some airplane has been passed by. Let's just increase the number so that's more obvious, for example, to a value of 15 or even 50. You can see now you have a lot of these contrails in this guy. You can also play with the strengths, for example, to make them more visible or less visible and so on. And all of the other values here are kind of quite self-explaining. So all of those updates are a quite nice addition for the clouds and the V-Ray Sun and Sky system. So speaking about skies, there's also a nice and welcome addition to the aerial perspective. So this scene, as you can see, uses the aerial perspective a lot. We have this very hazy effect here. 
And traditionally, if you checked your alpha channel, this kind of area perspective would always interfere with your alpha channel. So you can see we don't really have like a very clear cut of the sky. And now luckily in the area perspective, there is the option to affect or not affect the alpha. So if I switch this off and check my alpha again, you can see that now I have a clear alpha and this one is with the option enabled again. So that's quite nice to have now a clean alpha. Unfortunately, it doesn't really affect the other channels which kind of get messed up. For example, I have the Z depths in here. You can see also the aerial perspective kind of messes with the Z depths in a way that's not desirable. Or even in the normal pass, you can see there's this kind of like weird color here in the normals. So I hope this would also be fixed or addressed in another future edition. If you like to use V-Ray's own physical camera, you're lucky there have been some nice additions to this one. The first addition is that you can now override 3ds Max native resolution. So for this scene, I set a resolution of 1000 times 1000 pixel, and I can now override this resolution and change it on the go. For example, I can change here the height in here, and you can see this immediately updates. And the question is, when is this useful? It's very simple. If you have a scene that has a lot of different cameras and all of those cameras have to be rendered in different resolutions or aspect ratios and so on, then you can just set all of these information for each camera separately and then submit the whole scene to a render farm and the right resolution is always taken. You don't have to always resubmit the scene for each camera separately. So that's quite a nice and handy addition to the V-Ray physical camera. Another nice feature is that now you have the ability to show the proportion guides of the camera directly in the viewport itself. So I can choose this custom proportion guide. You can see that directly shows here in the viewport or I can choose a golden grid or a golden spiral or a golden triangle. And then in here, I can also enable all of them together, flip them horizontally or vertically, however I want to, in order to find the perfect composition for my picture. If you have scenes that use a lot of environment fog, then those render now much faster in V-Ray 6 update 1. So here you can see a comparison between V-Ray 6 and V-Ray 6 update 1. And update 1 can finish this quite a bit faster than the previous version without having to change anything about the whole scene setup itself. So now let's talk about some changes that have been made in the V-Ray denoiser. And here you have a scene that uses the denoiser quite drastically. So there's a lot of denoising going on in the scene. And I overall like the effect, but on this carpet here, for example, it just makes the carpet here very smooth and you kind of lose a lot of detail in here. So now with denoiser masking, you can easily select the carpet and exclude it from the denoising. So for this, I added a cryptomat render element. And then we just right click on this denoiser and select a cryptomat mask, for example. And now we can just pick our carpet and then we have to invert the mask because at the moment we just picked our carpet. We want to apply the denoiser to everything else than the carpet and now we can see the result that we have the denoiser happening here, but it's not happening on the carpet itself. So you can see that these parts here stay nice and crisp and only those parts here are getting denoised. So I think that's quite a nice addition. Also before the denoiser sometimes had issues with refractive objects. So everything in the refraction became over smooth. So with this denoising masking, you can easily exclude these parts from the denoiser and get the result that you want without having to go through an external software. Another new addition to the denoiser is that in the NVIDIA AI denoiser, you now have the option to AI upscale your image. And let's compare that now. We have this image, which is 1K resolution, and it took exactly one minute to render on my machine. And if you enable the NVIDIA AI upscaler, then it will render internally this picture in half resolution. So in this case, 500 times 500 pixels, and then tries to use AI to get a very similar result to this much bigger rendering in here. So now let's start a new rendering and then see the render time result and also compare both of those images. So this image now took 
20 seconds to render. So roughly a third to a quarter. And that kind of makes sense because it's also a quarter of the resolution. And now let's compare the two different results. So now in Photoshop, let's compare those different images. So as a base layer, I have the original 1K rendering. You can see this one, of course, will look the most clear and crisp. But now let's compare that to the AI upscaled version of this. And actually, it's probably difficult to see that through the YouTube compression. But considering that this has been rendered at only 50% of the resolution and only a quarter of the render time, roughly, you can get a result that looks overall kind of similar. So. Of course, it can't really do magic. If you check here the carpet, it would need to guess a lot of those details in here, which kind of disappear in smaller resolutions. And then this one will look much more blurry and over softened. But overall, the result is kind of impressive for a rendering that basically just took a quarter of the render time. Let's enable the AI upscaled image again. And in here I rendered the image at half of the resolution, so 500 pixels, without the AI upscaler, and then manually increase the size in Photoshop. Then you can see that if you see those lines in here, they're just way more soft, way more blurry in the rendering that's rendered at really half of the resolution without the AI upscaler than compared to the version with the AI upscaler. So again, I'm not sure if all of this is visible through the YouTube compression, but trust me, there is quite a considerable change in the quality of those two different pictures in here. There's also probably more ideal examples. So for example, if you render a full HD version and then use the upscaler to render that to uh, let's say 4K rendering or so, you will probably get a much nicer effect than if you try to upscale like a 500 pixel rendering to a 1000 pixel rendering. So the more information the AI upscaler basically has to work with, the better the result will be. There have been some changes to the V-Ray decal and here in the scene we have this kind of cylindrical object and I want to now blend this kind of graffiti on top of it. So let's enable the decal and see what kind of result we can get. So at the moment the decal is projected in a planar way on this cylindrical shape and this has some kind of issues. We can see that our decal is cut here. This I can reduce by increasing this normal angle and you can see this kind of improves it, but there's still these kind of cuts here on the edges. Even I increase the normal angle all the way to 180, you won't get rid of these cuts. And also the Dika is being stretched here because as said, it's being projected in a planar way. So this has been addressed in update one and now there's the option to bend the Dika. And if you take a look at the gizmo down here, you can see what will happen. So if I bend this decal here, for example, 45 degrees or 90 degrees, I can then wrap it much nicer around this can here. And I can even wrap it around the whole can if I want to by using a maximum angle of 360 degrees and just project this decal here all the way around this cylindrical object. So that's quite nice. I think in this scene, we're just gonna use uh, bend here of 90 in order to get the result that we want. And now let's check out some other small changes that have been done here. For this, let's scale up the decal here a little bit and also make it a bit wider because those options affect how the bump is being handled. And by default, you can see the bump of the base object is being transferred through the decal. But if I want, I can just use the only decal bump option here. Once I do this, then the bump from the base object is being removed. And you can see now this normal map here is basically completely flat in those part where the decal is. And then we can just use, for example, our own bump map. So I have this kind of like dotted pattern here on this decal. And if we want, we can also mix both of them together by disabling this option again. And then we have the bump from the base object here being mixed together with the bump from the decal itself. So all of those are the new additions to the V-Ray decal and it really helps with these kind of cylindrical objects and you can also control the overall look of your details much better. So finally there have been some changes to the V-Ray lights and I have here these three lights on the wall. Let's just enable them. And then you can see I have a new tab in here, which is called Decay. And with there, we can further control the look of our lights. 
So let's do a far decay first by enabling this here. Once you do this, it totally disappears because the start and end point is set very close to the light. Let's put this one here, for example, to let's say 200 centimeters. And you can see that it starts to fall off at 20 centimeters until a distance of two meters. And there basically a light has completely disappeared. So let's just put four meters in here. You can see that now the light is reaching more deep into the room. And if you wanna have this transition here shorter, you can also raise up the far start. So basically it doesn't decay here in this area and then it starts to decay in this area here. So you can really control how the light is basically illuminating your scene. You can see here, the light is basically just cut off. And if I disable this, you can see that the light is reaching much, much further into the room. And also you can see a pre-visualization of the fall off here in the viewport, which is quite nice. So the fall off is happening here between those two different parts. You can also enable a near fall off. So once I do this, for example, I can make a near fall off between 25 and let's say 100 centimeters. So you can see that now there's this gap in between here. If I enable this again, you can see that now the light is reaching more close to the wall. So with a near fall off and a far fall off, you can really control how your lights affect your scene. And that's actually quite nice to have this option in there now. So those were at least in my opinion, all the major new features in V-Ray 6 update one. There's of course additional features and you can find a whole list here in this forum post, which I'm gonna link in the description of the video. There's for example, also USD support now or some nice additions for GPU rendering and also a lot of small changes and bug fixes. So if you like this kind of content, subscribe to my YouTube channel to stay updated on new tutorials and feature releases. And if you wanna go the extra mile, you can also support me through Patreon and get access to all of my scene files and also a lot of additional goodies, such as a whole course on car rendering and so on. So see you over there if that's interesting for you. Otherwise, in the next tutorial, take care and see you soon.